I always like to start by reminding us why we are here as the charity regulator. What is it we are here to do? What are we set up to do? And just put it in that context. And many will have been around when the, the regulator was set up um, over 12 years ago now um, on the back of a number of charity difficulties. The idea being that as a, as a regulator, we could contribute to public trust and confidence in charities. Now, we know we are only a part of that jigsaw. It's charities themselves that inspire the trust and confidence, the high levels of trust and confidence they have in the public. But a regulator can help underpin that. And that's something that we've seen time and time again in the surveys we do every couple of years um, with the public and with charities. And the public will tell us that it's a very good thing for a charity sector to be regulated. It does help in terms of their confidence. Now, they don't always know who Oscar is. So that's a wee challenge for us that we're trying to sort of do more about. Uh, but they do that, that, that issue of, of regulation being something that really does underpin public trust and confidence is quite, is, is, is very much something that we see time and time again. So who is it that we really work with? So we work with charities and we have to remember the sector that we work with, the nature of that sector, the makeup of that sector, which is very, very weighted towards the small charities. Um, 50% of all charities have an income of less than £25,000. That's very small. It's not really enough to have a full-time member of staff if they're going to have somewhere to sit and have a computer and, 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 and. Um, so very small charities, volunteer-led, volunteer-run. And that does mean that we approach our work very much from a, a preventative um, um, a, focus. We want to be as preventative as possible. We want to be as proportionate as possible. And we want to give charities really a, a sporting chance to get it right before we start with our enforcement scary arm where we, we, we try to, to, to deal with problems once they've happened. We would rather problems did not happen at all. And that is what we are here to do. So in doing that, who's our audience? Who are we working with? We are working with charity trustees. They are a regulated community. Now, we don't have a specific number of how many charity trustees there are in Scotland, um, and that's partly a, a challenge that we have in the way that our legislation was set up, in the way that we can keep track of charity trustees. Um, and some of you will have seen that there's a consultation on at the moment in terms of charity law, and part of that is having a bit more of a, a concrete handle on that on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of number of charity trustees. But it's well over 150,000 charity trustees working in Scotland on a voluntary basis, contributing to the fantastic, impactful sector that we do have here. And they are a regulated community. They are the people who are in management and control of charities. They are the people who have charity trustee duties under charity law. So acting in the best interest of your charity, acting with care and diligence. That is what charity trustees are there to do. So they are our regulated community and they are who we are working with. Oh, so when we talk about charity trustees, we like to be quite celebratory about it. We like to say that what we see is a, a massive number of very dedicated people who are contributing to, to this vibrant charity sector across Scotland, trying to have impact, whether it be in Scotland, whether it be in the wider UK, whether it be further afield internationally. But these charity trustees are the ones who are charged with making that happen. And it's quite a responsible position. Um, and it's something that, that, that's done with a lot of heart and it's done voluntarily in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases. So we talk about them as a sort of silent, quite quiet superheroes. So that they get on with their work and they do it quite quietly, but without them, we would be a much poorer society across Scotland. But actually, when we put the title of the, the, the talk up, there was some kickback and said, no, it's not about heroes. They're not heroes. We're professional people who are there to kind of, you know, do the right thing and, and, and we have to have skills and we have to do all that. I think that is also true. I think there's a lot of skills uh, that charity trustees need to have or need to develop in their trusteeship. And that's a very important part of it. So part hero, part professional person and big part volunteer. And so put that package together and what you have is a pretty special person who is doing something pretty phenomenal in terms of trying to really make um, Scotland and the wider world a better place. But when we go out and about, which we do quite a lot, we do our Meet the Charity Regulator events, we take part in other activities, we take part in other events. Um, the one of the first things that, we, that people will say if we ask, what are the challenges you are facing at the moment? People will say, 
The challenge we are facing is trying to get enough trustees. The challenge we are facing is trying to get trustees who are maybe a bit different, have different skills. The challenge we are facing is trying to get the average age of our trustees down a little bit, because it's quite high, generally. Um, these are challenges that most, or many, not all, but many charities are facing. We did a little survey, it was only 250 people, so uh, please do not put much scope on this, but we did actually just talk to quite a few people, and what they said was 72%, it's the number on the, in the wee green one, well, I've got a wee thingy here, look, a wee doobity. 72% um, find new trustees by word of mouth. Not surprising, that's the way it has tended to work in the past. It's quite an effective way very often of finding new people for your, for your board, uh, your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your, your friend down the road who's got certain skills. Not a bad way of attracting new people in, but that is a high percentage just by word of mouth. Um, and the other one I would just say, 33% say they're recruiting trustees every year. Now that's quite a high number. It's quite high, it's quite hard to always be in that cycle of recruiting new people, bedding them in, making sure they know what they're doing, getting that kind of team together around the board table. So that's quite a high figure as well. We're going to talk about the steps. We've got a nice wee leaflet here. Let me just show you. It's very basic, but it's about trustee recruitment, and any of you who have been to the stand may have, have picked this up. And through it, we just go through some steps that's probably good to think about when you're thinking about trustee recruitment. I'm going to go through these in quite a, a quite high-level way, um, but hopefully some of these will give some, some interesting pointers to things that you've probably thought about already, but if you haven't, then you might go away and think about those. But I suppose the first thing to always say is, you have a governing document and there may be some very specific rules in those and you may have be restricted on who you can and cannot have on your board and that's the first place to start who can you not have on your board who, can, who have you to have on your board um, and sometimes you yeah it might be something specific you might need server user representation you might need membership on the board. Uh, you might need to co-opt people onto the board, uh, councillors, some people have councillors on the board as part of their governing document. So going back and looking at the governing document and say, are there any restrictions? What does that say to us? Let's just be clear about that. Um, and I'm sure all of you have dusted down your governing document lately, uh, but, we are, <laughs> but we are always quite surprised. We're not surprised. I'm not surprised at all because um, in my day job, I'm very, very good at governance. In my other job, when I'm outside, I realize how challenging it can be and to sort of think of getting that governing document and looking and looking and getting, studying all these details is not the most exciting thing in the world but we do hear a lot of like charities who say oh I haven't seen the governing document for hmm, hmm, oh, I don't know 10 years 15 years so dust it down and check you've got the rules right because sometimes it will be very helpful in terms of deciding what you do now I think when we talk about a skills audit it sounds sort of big and vaguely uh, complicated but I suppose all a skill a skills audit means is like just thinking about the board that you have and the board that you would like to have and the board that you end up having will probably be somewhere in the middle of that so, you know you probably can't get everything that you want um, but having an understanding of the skills on your board is quite important in terms of like finding the gaps um, and one of the boards that I sit on um, with the Cora Foundation, I sit on the Cora Foundation, um, they, they, when I, I recently joined, they, they, they already knew some of my skills, but they did a skills form and we had to fill in everything that we were good at. It's massively long, of course. Um, and, and things where we felt we had something to offer the organisation. So we, we filled that in. And so therefore, they now have an oversight of the board. And as they're thinking of the next board recruitment, they can think about where the gaps exist. But that's quite a, you know, a complicated organisation, quite a sophisticated organisation. If you have a small organisation, it might just mean a chat around your board. Like, we've got this, we've got this. Where are, where are the gaps that we have at the moment? And I think sometimes that may actually change over time. The context may change. Um, when we think about what happened last year with all the safeguarding uh, malarkey that went on and all the chat around that, there were organisations who were suddenly a little bit nervous about that and they might have suddenly thought, well, maybe it would be good to have a little bit more safeguarding expertise on our board, for instance. And so therefore you might go and seek that person to actually have oversight. Now, clearly, 
It's no getting away from it. These things are collective responsibility. But having the skills on the board to help have these discussions in the right way, to, to help have the right level of oversight can be very useful. So your board might change over time, depending on how you're changing, how you're developing, how you're growing. Um, some small charities don't really, you know, wouldn't get very excited about have, having some fundraising expert on their board. But actually, as you're getting better, you might get better. As you're growing, if you're growing, if you're investing in fundraising, you might want to have that oversight on your board. You might want to have somebody who's got specific skills in that area. So your board may change over time. So some level of skills audit in terms of recruitment is, is useful. Attract and advertise. And, and already some of you around the room have, have, have um, talked a little bit about this. Uh, but again, it's like, you know, if you have a great service and people know it, that you're sort of advertising yourself every day by what you actually do and by what you're doing in the community. But if you're going to be looking for new trustees and you want to reach out somewhere else where you haven't reached out before, you need to be able to express that in a way that people will understand, people will get excited about, people could see how their contribution might make a difference. Um, and just having some way of capturing that in a simple way for a new audience is quite important. And so what does the charity do? What difference does it make? And then find a place that you would want to advertise. And when we say advertise, again, that sounds quite expensive. Because, of course, if you're going to put an adver ad advertisement in The Guardian or in The Times or in the whatever, that is expensive. But there are now many, many more different places. I think the idea of having something that's more communal is quite interesting. But at the moment, there are a number of places where you have... Uh, roles that are advertised for for trustees and I've just put well newspapers that's a bit general but you know good moves which is SCVO here they have trustee roles advertised now some of these are some of these are free some of these are not free but they're often not massively massively expensive so sometimes it's worth investing in them obviously you've got job sites but the ones at the bottom volunteer Scotland increasingly have roles advertised I have trustee roles because trustees are volunteers a uh, small charities coalition does a very good job of getting trustees uh, trustees opportunities for smaller charities up there um, and uh, there's different ways and there'll be I've only put an example up there but there will be other people who are offering that opportunity to put your opportunities up there so it gets a slightly wider audience clearly and we've talked about this before not everybody loves social media not everybody uses social media but if you're on social media you can find ways of using that to advertise your positions and get that message out there and that can be an effective way and very often does reach a different audience depending on who you're who who's who's on your facebook page who's on your instagram who's on your uh, twitter and so on and I've put professional associations up there, not so often that you can get an advert in there, although sometimes you can, but professional associations are increasingly uh, sometimes trying to encourage their membership to get involved in trusteeships. The, the Institute of Fundraising, for instance, encourages its members to think about that as something they could give back to the organisations, uh, not just in a, in a practical role on the ground, but as a trustee on a board. And there's other professional associations that do that. And then there's that wider issue of uh, companies, private companies, who are freeing up their staff, actually, and giving free time to, to release them into the, into, the, into the wilderness as trustees. And so there's sometimes in your local environment, there may be a company that wants to give their, their, their staff some development opportunities. And that might be a way, again, of, of a, attracting somebody in. And again, that's like about putting an advert on their notice board or talking to their, the person who's in charge of that bit of the business in the company and so on. So there's ways of reaching out to new audiences. Now, when you've done all this fantastic work, you obviously get hundreds of people beating down your door going, I'd love to be your trustee. So then you have to choose the right person for, that, for the job. Now, clearly, that doesn't happen very often. But for my card position, I was interviewed, formally interviewed, because they got a lot more people for the roles than they actually needed. So there was a very formal interview. But even if you're not choosing between you know, six or seven different people, you might still want to have that initial conversation to check that the expectations are the same on each side. Does the, does the person know what they're coming into? Do they really want to take that on board? Because yes, you want the numbers, but you do want the quality as well. You want somebody who's engaged with that. So having some initial conversation with them, some kind of interview is uh, structured in some way so that there's a, a mutual respect, a mutual kind of shared expectation about what the role the trustee is going to take on, I think is quite important. 
And then, of course, you've got to go back to your governing document because there'll be different ways of electing them onto your board. And you'll all have done that in the past. You'll all have been in that process. Um, and it might be, you know, your membership has to vote. It might be if second or first, first or second or all that stuff. Whatever it is, you've got to fo fo follow your governing document and get the people on board. Um, I put in their trustee declaration forms, not because there's something sacrosanct about them, but there is a, quite a good thing about having a formal agreement with your trustee saying, this is what I'm signing up to, I'm a trustee, sign, sign, sign. When we open it, when a charity gets registered with us, eh, we, we do ask for trustee declaration forms, but we don't do it later on in the process when you're just getting new trustees. So finding a, new, a way of just formalising that, I think is quite important in terms of the relationship, the ongoing relationship you have with your, with your trustees. And this, in a sense, sort of speaks to a couple of points that people raised about the, the handover, about what, what, what you do with your new trustees. And I think induction is a very important thing. Now, induction, again, sounds like something big and complicated, or can sound like something big and complicated. But it's really about just making sure that the person who's coming in is getting the information they need to, to hit the ground, not, if not running, at least uh, not taking fairy steps, actually being able to contribute from an early stage around that board table. So that induction process is quite, is quite important. Now, again, if you have a fairly uh, large established charity that's quite complicated, you, you will probably have a well-established induction pro programme. When I started with Cora, I got a massive folder. It's like gold-plated. Of course, the knew I was from Oscar, so I don't know whether they, they, got, <laughs> they got it particularly switched by then. But, you know, very nice booklet with all the basic documents in them, and they may be all these different things, you know, what's the purposes, what's the vision, what's your key policies, you know, what do you do about staffing or what is your staffing complement, you know, all these basic stuff that you would expect to know as a board member to understand the organisation. And then beside that, we did some key meetings with key staff, we sat down, we, we, we understood a bit from their perspective what it was they felt they were trying to achieve. Um, in the next month or so, we're going out to visit some of the work on the ground, stuff that they're supporting, because they, they, they obviously are, are a funder. Um, and, and just to understand the work on the ground. So that has been, to me, a very good induction process. I have been to one board meeting and one audit committee meeting, and I already feel that I can contribute quite, um, quite in, in, in a constructive way to that discussion. I don't feel out of my depth. So that induction process is, is, is important. Now, again, you've got to make it fit to your organisation. So if you have a small, tiny organisation, you do not need a big, complex inter induction process. You probably just need to see what are the key policies that we have. Okay. Uh, if you're working with vulnerable people, what, for instance, where's our safeguarding policy? Where's this? Where's that? Get that, those basic things together. Sit down with the new, the new trustee and make sure they know what you're doing. And I think the, the idea of mentoring comes in well here. Sometimes either before they become a trustee or in the first year of being a trustee, depending on how confident they are, having some set, something set up that kind of helps mentor people into their roles is a pretty, a pretty powerful thing in terms of giving people the confidence to really contribute to the organisation. And now I'm going to come to the, the, I'm coming to the end of what I'm going to say now, but the, the, there is one of the, the challenges that we do here is that whole issue of how do we get younger people involved in this. And I see younger people around this room, eh, certainly younger than me, and I'm not old, so. Um, but no, but, but even then, if you take, the, I think the average age, where's Miles? What's the average age of? It was 50, it's gone up to 62. That's really going in the wrong direction. So the average age of the charity trustee is 62. So we need to start bringing that down. Um, and I think we have seen a number of very positive things going on at the moment to try to build up the idea that young people don't just have to volunteer on the ground, they can also volunteer as trustees in a way that could be extremely good for an organisation, both in terms of bringing new ideas in, onto the board, but also in terms of that succession planning. And in fact, if you get young people sucked into that, that life of trusteeship early on, then the, the, the signs are that they will do that throughout their life and you've got a convert there that will contribute maybe not always to your charity but will be somebody who's contributing to the sector overall so I think working with that population is a, a massively positive thing to do um, obviously when you're recruiting a, a, that 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 a younger population you have to think where you're advertising how you're doing it are you going to attract the right people 
But it's the same kind of stuff. Have you got the right induction in place? What would it look like for this young person? Do they need slightly longer mentoring because they're slightly more cautious about doing it? Um, at the Trustees Week event last year in November, we had a very, very good presentation um, from a young trustee who talked both about what she'd been able to contribute as a young tr trustee, but also the challenges and barriers that had been put in her way to become a young trustee. And it was extremely enlightening because I think sometimes we put barriers up to things without meaning to and without, making, without, without it being intentional. But she talked very eloquently about how, how she felt she had a lot to offer. She didn't feel she had more to offer than anybody else, but she had something to offer, and it was often quite, dif um, quite different from some of the other people around that board table. So encouraging that participation is quite good. We should have a blog at some point quite soon on our website from this very individual, so we'll be chasing it up soon. Uh, but it's worth a read, just understanding that. But as I say... There are some really good initiatives at the moment, and we have Miles in the room, so if anybody wants to ask about Get On Board Napier pro Programme for Young Trustees, he's your man. There's also an initiative that started relatively recently, I, I, I think it was just last year, in the middle of last year, but by, it's being run by um, International Voluntary Service, and it's about young trustees, getting run, young people involved in trusteeship. So these are two things, but my sense is, and Miles could probably say more than that, that these are things that are beginning to happen elsewhere as well, in other universities, in other colleges, in other places. And I think that there's a, there's a place that if you have the capacity to bring on a young trustee and give them the appropriate support, that could actually really yield dividends for, for, for your charity and for the sector going forward. So I think that's a... That's a positive thing.